morning, everybody. I think we'll just get started. Uh, attendance is still a bit sparse, which is undoubtedly testimony to what a wonderful evening everybody had yesterday. So um, I think we'll just uh, start and let the latecomers kind of trickle in. In case you weren't with us yesterday, I'm Melinda Crane, and it is my great pleasure to moderate today's second day of Transforming Transportation. And maybe just uh, a brief uh, reminder of what we did talk about yesterday in case you weren't with us. We had a really, really intensive, um, information-packed day that took a look at some truly transformative approaches and innovations when it comes to urban living and transport. And uh, just a reminder, we began with President Calderon's really inspiring vision of cities that are connected compact and coordinated and the contribution that they can make to truly socially and economically inclusive growth. And of course, in that respect, also contribute not only to the realization of new sustainable development goals, but also, of course, to a new climate economy, to realization of the kind of climate targets that the international community hopes to set in Paris at the end of this year. Our first two plenaries uh, picked up on the themes that President Calderon set for us. They expanded both on the advantages of coordination and uh, on the advantages of uh, being compact, being dense. Uh, they talked about coordination both in the vertical sense of cities coordinating with national authorities uh, of people really working together on a vision for what cities can be vertically and horizontally, links between cities across regions, across the globe. We talked about a number of different urban networks that are promoting best practices, sharing knowledge, and trying to um, create really, really firm commitments for cities. We also talked about horizontal links between urban planners and transport authorities within cities. Uh, an effort to really plan cities in a way that can make them more compact, more coordinated, and more connected. As I heard, you also had very, very productive parallel sessions yesterday afternoon. There will be more of those, of course, today as well. And our final plenary yesterday was that very productive, very hands-on discussion about road safety. Quite a wide-ranging look, again, at best practices in road safety, at where we need to go, and the degree to which there, too, we need linking up, we need a shared vision of all stakeholders regarding what they can do, their responsibility for making our roads safer. We want to build on one of the themes that I just mentioned today, namely connectivity. That is the subject of our first panel. But first of all, I would like to say thank you to all of the partners and sponsors who are making these very, very productive discussions possible. So I'll just remind you who those are. They include the Inter-American Development Bank, which of course is the main source of multilateral development funding in Latin America. They include the CAF Development Bank in Latin America, which is made up by 18 countries in Latin America, the Caribbean, and Europe, as well as 14 private banks in the region. Also, the Asian Development Bank, based in Manila, dedicated to reducing poverty throughout Asia and the Pacific. The Institute for Transportation and Development Policy, which works with cities worldwide to make them more sustainable. And the Partnership on Sustainable Low-Carbon Transport, the SLOCAT, which is a multi-stakeholder partnership that is promoting the integration of sustainable transport in global policies. Finally, special thanks to the TT15 Sponsors Transit Center, a New York City-based foundation that sparks innovations and supports policies that improve public transportation, and the PTV Group, which offers software and expertise to plan and optimize public and private sector transport and logistics. And just a reminder that you can also follow us on social media. That's hashtag uh, TTDC15 and also our website, www.transformingtransportation.org. And last brief housekeeping hint. Did anybody lose a phone yesterday? We found one. 
up here in the front. If you lost it, it is now at the registration desk uh, outside. And we lost something, namely three translation headsets. They are still missing, and uh, I must say they are quite valuable, meaning, unfortunately, they would be deducted from budgets for the future if we don't find them. So if you'd like to enjoy all those cookies out there next year, please uh, try to help us find those translation headsets. So, and now, to the subject of our first plenary. As I mentioned, it is connectivity. Connectivity, of course, like smart, can mean many things to many people. But two aspects stand out when it comes to transportation. The first is the power of networks, something I just mentioned, of course, of forging links across regional, institutional, modal, and sectoral barriers to promote true cooperation and creative change. And the second is the potential, of course, of new information technologies to make transport safer, more efficient, and more inclusive. And that's a potential that we also did, of course, address briefly yesterday in a number of our sessions. In this morning's panel on urban connectivity and its impact on business, we want to pick up on both of those aspects of connectivity. So the broader one of forging links and, of course, the more specific one of new ICT uh, and its applications. Once again, our panelists span several regions as well as the private and public sectors, and I will now move to my seat to introduce them. And um, I'm going to ask everybody to just kind of move down one seat so we can be closer together. Uh, that improves the chances of interaction. Thanks very much for that. And I begin uh, uh, alphabetically uh, this time, as we have done before. And I begin here on my right with Michael Dixon. He is the general manager for IBM's global smarter cities business. He leads IBM's vision, strategy, and operations for teams in cities around the world. He's been with the company since 27 years, and he's held a series of executive positions associated with the public sector, among other roles as vice president of the public sector for IBM's consulting and systems integration business. So a warm welcome to you. Seated next to him is Maricela Montoliu Munoz. I hope I've said that more or less correctly. She's director for the Social, Urban, Rural, and Resilience Global Practice at the World Bank Group, where she leads engagement in urban disaster risk management and regional planning. She previously served as manager for the Sustainable Development Department in the bank's Latin America and Caribbean region. She's been with the bank since 1988 when she joined its very first environmental unit. Warm welcome to you. And here on, my, uh, on the outside, on my left, Arvind Singhatia is a vice president for corporate affairs at Ola Cabs, which is India's Uber equivalent, uh, or perhaps uh, we might say uh, Uber is, uh, is, a, is uh, the global uh, equivalent of Ola Cabs. Uber, uh, Ola Cabs is currently valued at US $2 billion and is one of India's largest car rental companies. Prior to joining Ola, he was with Metro Cash and Carry as head of corporate affairs for North India, and he has also worked with industry associations in the area of technology, e-commerce, and modern retail trade. Great that you can be with us. And on my left, for the past seven years, Alejandra Moreno Toscano has been heading the Historic Center Authority of Mexico City, a city center listed among the World Heritage Sites by UNESCO. Her achievements in coordinating various levels of government, that's the connectivity angle, as well as private and public sector cooperation, has been recognized by the American Federation of Town Planners and the Mexican Senate, award-winning efforts there. So it's an honor to have you with us as well. I'd like to start out by getting each of your impressions and visions on how you see a truly connected city, given the fact that that term is sometimes uh, used uh, in a very broad sense. It'd be interesting to hear how you all see it. And if you could also tell us perhaps what advantages you think a connected city's citizens enjoy. And I'll start with you, uh, Ms. Munoz. It's on. Okay. Hello? It's, mm -hmm. it's okay, on. Okay, great. Well, coming from the, the practice in the bank who deals with social and urban, uh, let me bring that angle of social into the picture. Advantages of connectivity and, and uh, how to think about urban uh, smart cities. 
Um, normally, we think about smart cities as uh, cities who use you know, very sophisticated technology to uh, monitor, to plan. Um, and I would like, from uh, the perspective that I come, uh, to think of smart cities as cities that connect with their citizens and are able to capture the, the sense of what the needs are and also use the views of citizens to monitor with which quality and which effectiveness those services are being provided. I think that's, that's uh, an, an important element of connecting with the community of the city that, uh, that you're dealing with and an important aspect of smart cities. Um, that, that connection allows then also for easy flow of knowledge, learning, and eventually, you know, for that, that uh, ability to connect and innovate in the city. So I would like to pose to this, uh, to this uh, discussion that element of the bottom-up uh, connectivity that is important for a city to be really a uh, center for knowledge and innovation. Thank you very much. Michael Dixon, um, the same question to you, your vision of what is really a connected city, and perhaps you can tell us about the advantages, not only for citizens in general, but for business. Uh, as our title suggests, we're quite interested in that, that aspect of uh, how does connectivity enhance business and perhaps vice versa. Oh, well, thanks, Melinda. Uh, look, I, I think the first thing to, to really focus on is it's very early days. So, I in one sense, cities haven't really changed in 5,000 years. Um, we, we ha if we went back to a city in the Middle East back in those times, we would have seen people being educated in rooms, sick people being gathered elsewhere, public safety being the removal of people that needed to be kept away from others. And that really hasn't changed in about the last 20 years. And what changed 20 years ago was the rise of an electronic fabric that's been put in place in cities around the world, which for the first time is providing a level of connectivity that is allowing all sorts of other things to happen. So what we're seeing very much around the world in, in, in different ways, and I'll perhaps come back to that in a moment, but, but what we're seeing for the first time is people are able to share information and make decisions in ways that weren't possible in the past. So, you know, th there's a rising body of evidence and certainly, you know, um, magazines like The Economist and others are writing about fundamental changes in capitalism for the first time in a hundred years. We were starting to see the rise of an on-demand economy. Um, companies like Uber and the Uber in almost every industry, people are using the, the connectivity to provide news wa new ways of providing commercial transactions. And transport's a very important part of that because it's a, an it's essential way of bringing people together physically to do things that, that need to be delivered after perhaps a transaction is completed online. So one of the things I think that is critically important is to understand how cities can be integrated and from a transport po point of view, how that's done. Uh, from transport, we see four primary uh, trends, I think, around the world. The first is, is the optimization of existing assets. And depending on how we measure it, most assets are fairly poorly optimised if we think about roads or public transport. Um, these assets aren't very well used and so data is being used to start to understand how to change the way in which those assets are optimised. A, a second focus that's very important of course is the increase of capacity which is typically very expensive. So the adding of subways or the, the introduction of, of you know, major capital projects to change the way in which uh, public transport is to live in the city is a very expensive and slow process, but it's also something that many rising cities, many cities that are, have fast-growing GDPs are tackling. The third area is a very interesting one, which, which we kind of call connected cars. So the Japanese, the Americans, the Germans in particular uh, are working very, very fo with a great deal of focus on how do we connect cars to make, to change the way in which what we understand today to be private transport, we will own a car, will go away and we'll see shared uh, shared use of on-demand transport rather than us all owning our own car to drive from A to B, uh, which is causing so much difficulty around the world. Um, and we see this in, in, in fleets of electric cars being put in place in a variety of cities around the world. The fourth thing I think is, is very important, it's something we might touch on later from a policy point of view, um, is how do we administer what we might start to think of as urban mobility in this way? And how do we change the optimization of, of use of these kind of dimensions across a city? And, and for me, you know, the real opportunity there is in user pays pricing. So most of us are very familiar with our phone. If I use my American phone here and call my family in Australia, I'll, you know, in six weeks' time I'll get a bill. 
that I've used a phone in Washington from registered in New York to call in Melbourne or something, and I'll pay whatever that is, and I'm happy to pay for that service. Transport's not like that in general around the world. A and I think we're going to move to a point where people start to understand that user pays is something that we need to understand in transport, but there are very heavy policy implications that go with that. So if you take those things just in transport, you can apply the same kinds of thinking to health, social services, waste management, water management, buildings, energy, and these are just things we're just beginning to scratch the surface off. So I think for business, the real opportunity here is to work out what are the, bo what are the models, what are the business models, wh where do we improve service and reduce cost by applying some of this thinking and, and applying the technology. The technology itself is, from that sense, nothing special. It's something that can be applied. It continually evolves. We're not short of technology. It's the application of it that, that we're really focused on now. And we want to focus on more uh, details of that in just a moment, but I'm going to keep going down the line first uh, to get your visions on what a connected city really is. Uh, tell us yours, please, uh, Ms. Moreno Toscano. Well, um, imagine that um, the core of the city historical center is a 19th century city. So the transforming of the city in, I, I suppose, 10 years, 15 years, to put it in the nowadays um, uh, condition for uh, people to live in has been very um, fast, um, complicated, and needs enormously coordination with everybody. That that means that we need coordination with the federal level, with the provincial level, with the local city level, and with people who live in the city, who own the city, and who work for the city. So um, uh, as a summary, I will, uh, I will tell you that the um, use of technology to make uh, uh, vinculations, the um, conditions of Mexico City that has uh, um, uh, this uh, seismic condition, mm -hmm. uh, the condition of Mexico City that has a terrible um, uh, place in the world for climate uh, <coughs> a change because we are suffering the the um, bi violence of these um, conditions and the condition of Mexico City that it is a poor city. It's not a rich city, but it is very intelligent city. So we use technology, we um, use uh, transport in all its ways, including uh, Pieton, uh, transformation, mm -hmm. transportation, and what we are going, wha what we are working now is to make city in the city and construct uh, new places to live for uh, new families that we are looking uh, now to uh, uh, the way the families live now. Thank you very much. Uh, again, we'll expand perhaps on some of those details in just a moment, but let's now get Mr. Singatia's vision of a connected city and also what advantages it offers to business and vice versa. Thank you so much, Melinda. Uh, first of all, thank you so much for the kind words introducing me. Uh, you know, uh, our vision of connected city is really interesting. Uh, I see a city is connected when the citizens have peace of mind regarding the mobility in the, con in the city itself. If a citizen is confident enough to be you know, present at the right time, at the right place, all the times, I think that's a perfectly connected city. Uh, I belong to a country where you know, we have a huge landscape as well as huge population. And the biggest challenge that we face is you know, we should be present at the right time, at the right place. And we, we are struggling with that and we are now, the, the business model that we have now started using the technology, we are facing and the vision that we've kept in front of us is making available a transportation to every citizen of the country so that he can be present at the right place and give him the feeling of connectivity. 
the best part I feel about Washington when I'm here, and uh, I'm not absolutely worried about how I'll reach to the World Bank for this conference, because I know the moment I'll move out, I'll be having a, you know, a transportation available for me, and I'll reach it here on time. Had it been in India, I would have been prepared half of my day to identify the right transportation system to reach to the right place. We are, you know, uh, so to address this thing, the, to address the concept of connected, connected city, I think the role of technology is really crucial here. Uh, a technology that empowers the citizens, uh, giving them a chance to, you know, uh, have a control on the system and they are so confident that, yeah, uh, I can be, and you know, when the cities are connected, obviously businesses grows because every right transaction happens at the right time. And that this leads to a uh, complete growth of uh, economy. Uh, you know, uh, I feel that uh, there is a simple physics law which says that whenever an energy increases, there is an increase in the entropy, the randomness of the system. India is currently the place where energy is now on its higher levels. There is a lot of entropy, there is a lot of randomness, and now there is a time to uh, bring the concept of well-connected cities which will bring into, you know, which will translate into the prosperity of the country. That's how we feel and the, this, that is the vision with which we are working currently in India. Thank you very much. Um, uh, Ms. Munoz, would you say in your experience that a more connected city is also a more resilient city, both economically and uh, perhaps in a broader sense of that word? I know you do work in this resilience area. Does connectivity have advantages for a city's resilience? Um, yes, and the, the connections are multiple and one can actually uh, think of uh, many dimensions. Um, connectivity, uh, thinking of economics, uh, not only the type of connectivity that Mr. Dixon had mentioned about how you organize the business, but again, from my perspective, uh, from social and urban, the, the connectivity with, with, uh, of, of people to jobs and that ability to really reach in an affordable way from the places where they are housed to the places where the jobs are. That's an important element that has to do a lot with affordability and, and also with the attractiveness of the city uh, to, to business and, and the ability to reach and to integrate the labor markets better. So I think connectivity in terms of actually helping to connect people to jobs is an important factor which probably, uh, you know, complements the, the vision that, for example, Mr. Dixon can offer from the perspective of the private sector and the, the internal uh, perspective of the firm. Uh, and that, of course, has to do with, with uh, economic re resilience. Um, when we talk about resilience, of course, we are, we are talking about resilience normally to natural disasters. And uh, that has to do both, uh, I mean, usually, as, as we know, the, the cost, the economic cost and social cost of urban disasters has come up, uh, has multiplied lately. And it has to do very much with urban agglomerations uh, because uh, the cities tend to be located in areas which uh, can, can face, you know, are, are the areas of impact of adverse natural disasters. And there is large concentrations of people, investment, assets, infrastructure. Um, connectivity can, I mean, uh, allowing, uh, well, the, the link to connectivity is a little bit more indirect. Normally one thinks of uh, resolving issues of, of natural disaster resilience in terms of thinking of a better shape and not shape of the city, location of activities that can actually be in areas where the risk to this kind of uh, issues is lower. And also about how infrastructure is designed taking into account uh, technologies or thinking about redund the redundancy to provide more opportunities in case of in case a disaster hits, uh, to actually uh, provide you know more more resistance to these disasters. Uh, so in a way, in an indirect way, also the way in which we think about uh, transportation and connectivity, uh, both to allow for that integ special integration and, and allow uh, for keeping the city in areas where the risks can be minimized. And also uh, how we can think of connections that are more resilient, maybe with new technology, with, with te 
because of technology or because of redundant solutions can be a way in which we can think of the, the link between transportation planning and connectivity and that type of resilience that has to do with natural uh, environments. So. Michael Dixon, perhaps pick up, uh, if you would, for us on the question of integration, because I know that your Smart Cities program involves integrating many different aspects of urban life, from transport to planning to health, this is something we talked about a great deal yesterday. Can you talk to us a bit about how connectivity facilitates that and perhaps what new approaches that uh, makes possible? Uh, well, certainly, uh, Melinda. I'll, I'll just start by giving an example of, of something I, uh, uh, we're working on at the moment. Um, and then I'll come back perhaps to some specifics at a, at a broader level. But, I was speaking to someone recently who is responsible for a large police force and he was talking about issues in his city with domestic violence. A, a terrible problem, but something which he didn't believe was critical to his role as a police officer uh, running a police force. So his view was each weekend he goes to the same place and separates the people and you know, things sort out and it's back to normal on Monday. It's not something going the judicial system, it's not something he can readily resolve. So his approach to this is to engage social services and say to the social services uh, group in his city, this is a family with issues that it's a social services problem, it's not a policing problem and you need to get involved. So, so the social services people got involved and of course they come back and say, look, it's not really social services, it's a health problem because alcohol is involved and there's a real issue around alcohol and it's really alcohol and depression. Uh, and, and then they, they kind of started talking, they look, the real problem is unemployment and we've got to do something about chronic unemployment because if we can get these people employed, it's much less likely we're going to have these kind of follow-on effects. So, so this is a stunning change. H here are four government organisations who typically operated independently in very strong siloed structures, suddenly they're sharing information electronically about an individual or a small group of individuals that need help. So that kind of connectivity is something we're going to see increasingly through society. Here's a, here's a completely different view to a problem that is, is very much a problem in many cities. So I think that's an example of the kind of connectivity that this new electronic fabric I talked about earlier is providing. Um, I if we kind of go up a couple of levels, I think um, um, there are three separate dimensions that are very important. The first um, is that uh, business is engaging in these issues in a way that's not been possible before. A and that's happening largely because uh, federal governments since the GFC or national governments have withdrawn. They're focusing now really on just five things which is defence, customs, ports, borders, security, some kind of social security system, some kind of health system, and tax. And they're devolving all the other things as responsibilities to cities. In response, cities are engaging with the private sector in a way that's not happened before, to provide all sorts of services and capabilities to their people that perhaps in the past were paid for by a central government who just provided block funding to do these things. So, so if, we, if we think about that, the next kind of dimension is really important, and we were talking about this in our briefing before we started, um, there's a big difference between the metropolises and fast-growing cities around the world, particularly in you know, Asia and Latin America and Eastern Europe and, and, and Africa, where many cities are growing very quickly and, and have to get some of these things in place. So there's a real opportunity to provide these kind of innovative programs to really perhaps get over some of the issues the metropolises are now struggling with. And the third thing this does, except for the poor person who lost their phone yesterday that you mentioned, everybody at this conference has got a mobile phone. So, <laughs> so we have this pervasiveness now um, which enables people to, to um, spontaneously collaborate in ways that we're only beginning to understand the implications of. So I think if we put those kind of three overarching activities together and then think about you know our chief of police thinking about how do you how do you manage something as as chronic as the problem i mentioned we, we start we're just beginning you know, the, the point i'd like you to all to think about is um, we're just beginning to think about the possibilities in these kinds of, of areas i think that's why it's critically important that the world bank for example which is so active around the world in these areas um, has the opportunity to really promote some of these new developments Ms. moreno toscano the difference between emerging cities, cities that are still developing, still uh, doing basic planning about how they locate uh, 
resources uh, and assets. Clearly, they have a certain advantage because they can start fresh. They can build compact, dense, diverse uh, city centers. An existing metropolis, as Michael Dixon just reminded us, like Mexico City, big, sprawling mega city, it doesn't uh, start with that kind of advantage. It has to work with what it has. Um, can it still, in some way, re-engineer parts of the city in order to promote compact, coordinated, uh, connected um, inner city districts? Oh, oh yes, cities uh, always can uh, better the life of the citizens. But uh, let me tell you that in Mexico City, we are proud of our capacity of um, education and resilience. Because if you remember, uh, the city core of Mexico City was um, uh, lost in the eight, 1885 um, earthquake. But now you have um, the information um, to one minute before this is, is going to be in the city, in your cell phone, mm -hmm. in the um, public um, uh, alarm system that is in the city, one minute. With one minute of, of, of advantage, advantage, you can go out or you can go to safe places and everything is okay. You have, after the season, you have in three minutes the information with helicopters, et cetera, of what happened if there is something prob with a prob uh, problem of, of in the city, um, uh, public services, and um, uh, si the system of transportation, if it had something, uh, a problem, or it is okay, everything. and. People knows in 10 minutes after the earthquake that the city is working again. So this um, capacity of connection uh, that, that needs lots of education, lots of practical um, action, and, and, and lots of, of um, experience uh, analysis is very important. So in a city that is like Mexico City, enormous and, and complex, um, we um, know that um, the new conceptions of information and of interrelation of the people uh, with its public service or with its um, uh, spontaneous um, entertainment, <laughs> everything passes, uh, is changing the city. And the city servers have to change themselves and coordinate themselves in another ways to from, uh, make face to this enormous change of uh, epoch that we are living now. Thank you very much. Staying with those very large, uh, sprawling metropolises, Mr. Uh, Singatia, there was much discussion yesterday about motorization and uh, its drawbacks, of course, um, for so many parts of the emerging and developing economies. Um, the fact is, your service makes better use of existing assets, but it is still a motorized service. Is it, in that respect, only a transitory fix for the transport problems of uh, cities like uh, the megacities of India, or does it have a real long-term place, despite the drawbacks of motorization? Sure. Uh, you've really rightly said that, you know, uh, the whole transportation is currently based on the motorized uh, transport uh, system. Uh, interestingly, uh, in India, the, the whole economy is now on the upswing. And you know, in India, a motor vehicle is considered more closely with, uh, with emotions with, and with the status rather than you know, f just for the transportation. 
So with the, with the increase of prosperity, people are now heading towards heading more and having more and more vehicles with more bigger vehicles on road, creating the, you know, the, 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 the congestion problems, the traffic problems, the parking issues, pollution. Our role is all the more now become important because we are working with the mission to pull back uh, these uh, private vehicles and we want to give this similar kind of seamless experience to the commuters who, are, who, who would like to you know, bring out their uh, private vehicle. Uh, you know, the most important thing, you rightly said that we are using the existing vehicles that are available in the city. We are streamlining them with the help of technology. But in a city like Delhi or in a city like Mumbai, where, uh, you know, uh, the population is huge, the, the, the infrastructure is not that good. But what we have tried, I mean, uh, I would like to share with you that, you know, the ETA of a vehicle, that means the estimated time of arrival for the vehicle that earlier we were using was around 45 minutes for every vehicle. We have brought it down with the help of technology as well as streamlining the processes to now 15 minutes a vehicle. And we are striving to reach to a level where you can have a vehicle available in five minutes. It's not just, uh, you know, the, uh, the, 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 the motorized vehicle that we are talking about going forward. The anything and everything which is available for a surface transport is our target. For example, there are, there are small three-wheeler auto rickshaws in India which are very popular. In, in Delhi, there are more than one million. Uh, they, are, they are still, you know, in an unorganized way. They are moving everywhere, but they are still unorganized. There are, you have to haggle with them. You have to negotiate with them just to, uh, you know, have a comfortable journey. With the help of technology, we have bring them uh, under our platform. We have given them software. We have given them training. And now, sitting at your home, at, you can, the, the most cost effective way of commute, city commute, an auto rickshaw you can uh, you know, uh, book through an Ola application. Uh, going forward, we also see that as uh, the electronic vehicles are on the surge, uh, if we have, uh, so in, in New Delhi or in Mumbai, there are now many electric vehicles available who have commercial permits. Once they are fully full fledgedly available in the market, we'll definitely bring under our platform so that uh, the concept of motorization will go out and it's basically the commute with the help of technology become all the more important. Uh, we are helping people to move across the cities, across the states uh, without using their own vehicle. Uh, our estimate says that if we bring one Ola vehicle, it pulls up six vehicles from the road. Uh, and, 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 you know, there is something which is uh, helping in a big way in reducing the congestion, in reducing the po pollution problem. Uh, and, and it also uh, enhances the road safety because, you know, the drivers are professional drivers. And, uh, you know, uh, they are trained professional. A, a, and even if you are drunk or if you are not in your senses, at least they will help you <laughs> to reach your destination in a more safe way. <laughs> Michael Dixon, um, in your work, where have you seen really good, affordable, quick fix solutions to make urban transport in big existing cities um, more connected, more um, affordable, and greener? Well, it sounds very, oh. yeah. it sounds very attractive, Melinda, but you know it's a bit harder than, than, uh, than we'd like it to be. Um, I think there's, a, there's a, a real opportunity around the world to, to tackle these things both from a policy point of view and from a practical point of view. Uh, but I think it's important to understand that in our experience, many of the most innovative projects uh, come from places that have a real problem. And, and my view is that cities tend to not opt into transformational change. They, the, the ones that really do it are ones that are forced into it because they've got a real problem. So, uh, you know, I think all of us would agree that change is not something, uh, particularly in, in, you know, structural change that associated with many of our organisations, that people want to jump in and do. So it's usually, it has to come from a problem. And, and so we see some really good things happening in China, uh, certainly in Europe, in, in parts of the US, um, where things have been done to really address a chronic issue. So one of the things that, that I think is a very interesting trend that we're seeing around big cities with fixed public transport 
infrastructure is the rise of connected car fleets that essentially shuttle people to transport heads. So in, in many you know, large urban cities, you have an arterial rail system, for example. Um, and the idea of having a, a fleet of connected cars that people can use to get from their homes to the station and back again um, is a very attractive way to boost capacity and, and do something like this. Um, I, I think it's important to start talking about the fact that the underpinnings of all this is the data that is now being produced that in the past hasn't been. Uh, has anybody seen the film Moneyball? Does anybody know the film Moneyball? Say it again. Moneyball? Yep. Ah, you do, good. What, you know, it's a fantastic example of what I'm talking about. So uh, it's a film that's about 10 years old or so, about the Oakland days in, I think it was a 2002 season, you know, a completely <laughs> no-hoping team of baseballers. And, um, and Billy Bean, who was the guy, the Harvard guy that went out there, and, and no, the, the coach and uh, the statistician, said, we've got no money, we have no players, we're hopeless. And, and this statistician um, went out and said, if we look across all the talent pools of baseballers, here are the guys with e extraordinary statistics that don't get to play because they look terrible. So, you know, some I, I'm not a baseball fan, obviously you can tell by my accent, but you know, <laughs> some guy that throws and looks like he should, you know, be in hospital, but when they look at his statistics, he's got more people out or whatever it is than anybody else. And they bought him for nothing. And, you know, some guy who was grossly overweight, but, you know, he stole more fourth bases than anybody else in the league or something. So they used statistics to put together a team that cost next to nothing that won everything. But no one picked these players because they couldn't see that. So, you know, Harvard talks about the rise of evidence and fact-based management. You know, people like me have made a career by being well-educated and having experience. It's all gone. Show me the facts. Where are the facts? Give me the data. And, and we see young people particularly, you know, the next generation, people all younger than everybody here in the room, who, who are like lasers on saying, what are the facts here? You know, how many people get the car from A to B? How many people take that station? You know, what is the capacity of that line? How do I map that against the modelling that we have associated with the financial planning for this area in the future? That's the thing that's changing cities. And so I think it, you come back to a very strong assumption that I think we all should think about, which is most of the heavy fixed capital assets we have deployed in cities today are chronically underutilised in the transport sector. And so I think th there's very easy wins. So, you know, you look at, you know, cities like Eindhoven or Montpellier in France or, or Shenyang in China um, that are doing extraordinary change with their existing, existing assets because they're put in traffic management centres where they're aggregating data for the first time that gives them things they would never have dreamed of thinking about had they not seen the data that goes with it. So um, it, it's a very general answer to your question, Melinda, but I think um, you know, the themes are important here. The first is that people opt into it because it's a real problem. You've got to do something. Uh, I think the second thing is the data that underpins these decisions um, are, are really uh, available now for the first time. And I think the second, you know, the last thing is, you know, people often say to me, you know, what kind of technology can we use for a quick fix? The technology's there. And, and I very strongly believe that the best projects in the world are not great because of the technology or its application um, or um, the financials, which are very easy. Um, the problems are chronic and they're organisational and they're cultural and political. And, and certainly in my view, if you tackle those three things, the rest of the stuff is just work. So let's uh, take a look at the policy side. Ms Munoz, you have a comment and then I'd like to ask you uh, about policy tools. Yes, I wanted to go back to the discussion on motorisation. And yes, of course, that the new technologies have facilitated, uh, you know, better solutions on the private side, as uh, our colleague was saying, but also the complementarity with the solutions, the better solutions that they can generate in the public side. The same, the same type of information about uh, users, uh, patterns, etc., can help to have better design of public systems, and then more efficient and more effective. Which comes back to the issue of motorization and, you know. Uh, the consequences of motorization, pollution, etc. Uh, Seoul is a very good example where they have used data. Of course, Seoul is a very uh, data-rich uh, city, but it's a good example of how they have used data to design routes and uh, fleets for public uh, transportation, which are much more efficient. So that complementarity between private and public is important. 
and both can use the new data and technologies. In terms of policies that have to do with motorization, of course, it's a broad range of things. We all know, I mean, in Mexico, in my country also, issues of uh, fuel subsidy are, are uh, very crucial because when you, do, when you make uh, subsidies much cheaper than they really are, there is much more incentive to, to use uh, the car. Uh, these days, probably with the low cost of, uh, of oil, this, uh, this uh, situation temporarily doesn't become that critical, but it has been historically very critical. And so it goes from policies that are very broad to policies that have to do more at the local level with land, the way land is managed. Housing, for example, in our countries also, when we, um, I mean, I'm talking about the context of Latin America, when we do, for example, housing affordability indexes uh, that are used in order to plan for housing projects, usually the transportation cost is not included. We include maybe the land, we include the construction, some of the local infrastructure of service in the houses, but transport, the cost of transport is not included. And the consequence is that in planning for those housing uh, projects, we are not thinking about the importance of uh, a compact city and a more affordable, a more accessible uh, uh, solution for those housing projects. So. Thank you very much. I'd like to ask all of you to perhaps highlight a couple of policy tools that you think have been effective in promoting urban connectivity and in promoting cooperation between political authorities and business and the business sector. That, of course, is a focus of this session. I know that that kind of cooperation was viewed as absolutely essential to the success of revitalizing Mexico City's historic center. So maybe you can tell us about some of the particularly effective tools that you used, both to coordinate between regional, federal, and municipal authorities, and also between those, p those actors and business. Well. Uh, let me <coughs> let me talk about the um, uh, big big opportunity for business and uh, new activities that are the transit centers, the connectivity places, the points where the new city is building itself. Because now we must think this uh, great commutation com commuton mutinal centers as a place where you have to have service of, of um, um, education, um, uh, health, and information, and, and con connection, etc. Not these, these big centers of the city where you commute your uh, system of transportation. As you know, we have a very large metro system. Uh, we have the introduction of, of Metrobus that uh, has um, uh, been very rapid and has an effect in reduction of, of pollution very interesting. And we have these uh, new um, examples of introduction bikes and, and rent cars in uh, elec electric renters, etc. This cannot be done if you don't have a very um, uh, clear uh, uh, analysis of what is going to be the cost and who can uh, help you to uh, superate this condition. No? Then uh, you have uh, the information for the private sector you have the information for another public um, um, a multinational um, apportations that you can have, or uh, uh, international programs, and you uh, can have the um, coordination of the finance uh, system of Mexico. So what you must uh, try to do in these big, big cities is um, that all the agents, all the actors, all the important participants in, in one policy must have this um, uh, easy uh, vinculation with um, uh, looking systematically what is the problem. Uh, if, 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 if it is there a problem, more than the city, <laughs> no. 
but you must uh, see are we in the right um, way or what is difficult thing. And so information, that's information, information and coordination of, of actors, institutions, and, and people, expertise and experience can help very much the uh, recovery of uh, uh, cities that, that needs always to be at, um, in the move, I mean, to change themselves, to have the people that live there uh, in their um, present and with their opportunities of their time, even if they live a city that has 1,700 years old. Um, Mr. Singer, here, America's Ola cabs, namely Uber, uh, it has had some difficulties with policymakers in Europe, uh, also occasionally here as well, but certainly uh, in Europe, uh, in Germany, the country where I live. What has been your experience working with policymakers in India? How is uh, public-private sector uh, coordination uh, working in your particular case? Yeah, so that's an interesting thing to discuss because um, the growth of uh, both these services across the globe as well as in India was so rapid that uh, the policymakers were still trying to figure out uh, from where we have come from, who we are, in which bracket of regulatory framework they should put us in. Uh, the interesting part here is we are, you know, uh, in India, uh, authorities are uh, quite cooperative, they are quite swift in understanding the needs of their cities. There was, uh, I mean, everybody knows the incident that have happened in Delhi and that have impacted the whole uh, industry across uh, the country. Uh, but, uh, but the authorities were... Just in case people don't, an inst incident of assault uh, yeah. involving an Uber driver. Yeah, in an Uber driver. Allegedly. Yeah. So, uh, but then, you know, the fallback was on all the similar kind of services in India. And since we were the biggest, I think we faced the maximum amount of uh, challenges from the authorities. But the good part here is they were trying to understand that so, uh, it was, it's, we are just four years old and authorities were unaware that, you know, we were on the roads from last three, four years. But after this in incident, they uh, took a, uh, cognizance of the situation and they tried to uh, understand that, okay, how we operate, what is our modus operandi, uh, how technology is implemented, and then how they can be a part of the whole system. And they are also trying to pull us in the mainstream of uh, the current uh, setup of regulations that they have. Uh, the most important uh, thing that I feel uh, authorities should understand here is, you know, uh, whenever they are planning uh, cities and the transportation networks across the uh, country, the, the only thing that's missed by them is the last mile connectivity. You know, uh, if for example, in Delhi, we have a wonderful metro network, but then last mile connectivity is still missing there. And we, as an intermediary public transport services, IPT, we are now, you know, bringing that uh, the last mile connectivity in place. Uh, regulations like a common payment platform for the uh, multimodal transport systems will help, uh, you know, to streamline the uh, the and to help the cities connected well uh, uh, is what you know we think and expect from the authorities. So uh, from the banking sector, from the transportation authorities, as well as from the urban development uh, authorities, we expect that you know, uh, people like us should be given an opportunity to become, the part, become a part of the planning process whenever they are doing. We, we can definitely help them uh, because we are using analytics in a big way to understand the commuters' behavior across the city. We are using technology to identify the roads, congestions, traffic situations, uh, anywhere. This will uh, incidentally help the authorities to, uh, you know, uh, identify where they need to have flyovers, where the traffic congestion is more, where uh, and uh, which places have more traffic during specific days. And this also helps, uh, you know, us to, uh, you know, help our drivers to earn more because wh when there is more demand, we, we, we push them towards the right area. Uber has uh, announced this week that it's going to now be sharing its data with the city of Boston. Oh, yes. uh, 
Are you already doing something like that, sharing your data, data with cities? And I must uh, ask uh, so that you can perhaps combine this in your answer. We know that Uber has connect, collected some very personal data, for example, in San Francisco, some data that many people might regard as invasive of people's privacy rights. Um, what do you do about that? And is that the kind of data that we really want to be sharing with urban authorities? No, so uh, I have, I'm very categorical as far as the collection of personal data from the person's uh, system is concerned. We are absolutely no on that. We are only collecting the data when the person is on a booking and they are using our software. The moment they are out of it, there is nothing that is collected from the system. And the very, very basic data is collected from the person's phone. Uh, for example, the location as well as the destination which they are going, not more than that. And we are not trying to, because that is anyways not useful for, not for us, not for the authorities, right? Uh, coming to the first point where, uh, uh, you know, the sharing of data with the authorities is concerned, we are now at the verge where we can share the uh, analytics that we are ready with. And now we are in 60 cities in the country, almost every big city of India we are present. Uh, and we are, so you know, so it's a, it's a very rapid growth. We, our teams are now in place. We, our database is now in the shape of sharing. So very soon you'll hear news from Ola also sharing data with uh, the Delhi government or with the, you know, uh, the other state governments. Um, Ms. Munoz, all of you have given uh, quite an upbeat account of the uses of ICT and the uses of big data for a number of different purposes, and I'll just run through them briefly. Um, Fact-based policy making, resilience, also in the sense of monitoring uh, vital uh, ge geological and other uh, uh, statistics in order to prevent disasters or adapt and cope with them when they occur. So monitoring. Um, uh, analysis, clearly also promoting uh, sharing between different actors who need to be making policy together, bringing a multitude of stakeholders uh, involved in policy making. Also, of course, transport planning in this, in this sense of connectivity that we've talked about in so many of our plenaries here. So a multitude, clearly, of important, productive, useful applications. But associated with that, of course, is the question of data. We're collecting a whole lot of data. Uh, Michael Dixon just said, give me the data. A lot of people are worried that once the data's out there, it can be abused. How concerned are you about that? Um, hmm. Well, for developing countries, it's a process that it is at an early stage. And actually, we are at the stage where the benefit of, of the availability of data, uh, I think, outpaces the, the, the drawbacks, you know? Uh, the drawbacks come when you get to this very specific uh, capture of data and, you know, where the risk... Hmm. Uh, so I, I would still keep my upbeat uh, approach to it. Um, Yes. <laughs> Maybe Michael Dixon will now tell us what kind of safeguards are out there. And I'm thinking, of course, both of the aspect of private data, a big, big concern in Europe, uh, where I live, um, a concern that has uh, led to many, many issues involving Uber, for example, also regulatory issues. Uh, but also the other question, hacking. Um, we've seen increasing incidences of hacking into big databases. What kind of safeguards are out there, and is trust an issue that could become a barrier uh, for promoting connectivity in cities if, if citizens become more and more alarmed about abuses? Uh, this is obviously a, a major area, Melinda, and security is an incredibly important part of all of these issues. So um, there's no doubt that a lot has been done and a lot remains to be done to improve the level of security associated with the systems that are being put in place, again, that are relatively new. So, so I think it's important to understand that there is an in incredible focus on security as an issue which is being worked on. I think there are two other issues that we're talking about here that are very important and need to be considered separately. The first is the government's responsibility to ensure that policy and, and um, effective safeguards are put in place um, 
in all areas. It's something the government is expected to do, it's something that they are focused on doing and it's something that we work very closely, certainly at IBM, with jurisdictions around the world to ensure that the local policy provisions are met and the policy is evolving at a rate which is at least in pace with the opportunity to provide some of these data and activities. There's a second thing that I think um, is very important, it's underreported, although there is a lot of focus and a lot of interest in it, and that is how younger people see their data. And uh, I am very much of the view that um, uh, we've got to kind of, not, too, not trying to be too crude, but we talked about, you, you, know, you said that I, you paraphrased me, so I said, give me your data. There's a simple kind of parallel to that, which is give me your data or give me your money, but you've got to do one of the two. Uh -huh. <laughs> um, and, and I think we're only starting to understand what that means. And, and I had a very interesting discussion a long time ago now, at least a decade ago, uh, with the, the man that was responsible for running borders in Australia. And we were talking about biometrics, the introduction of biometrics at, at airports in Australia. And um, I, I, we were talking about privacy in these issues. How, how are you going to fix this? And he said, oh, it's really easy. I'm going to fix this very easy. And I was quite surprised by his, his kind of blasé attitude to policy around biometrics in passports. This was, um, it was I, I think it was before 9-11, uh, uh, actually. But he said, we're, we're putting in biometrics and it's an opt-in system. So he said, if you don't want to opt in to providing your biometrics, that's okay, that's your line over there. But he said, that's where I'm putting all my people because they're the ones I'm looking for. So it's really interesting kind of thinking. And, and I think one of the things that, that we have to understand is that young people today will, s will provide their data in a flash if it means they get better service and better cost performance. People like us are much less comfortable with that model. So I think we've got to think about that. How do we combine the policy level interest of governments in regulating data and making sure that anonymisation and effective modelling and all the rest of it protects privacy provisions? But at another level, we've got such stringent requirements on financials there now, governments are unable to provide the level of service that the private sector provides to individuals who consume their products. But the people want that. So people are quite happy to surrender privacy details when they're buying groceries or buying airline tickets or buying holidays or using their mobile phone or banking or, you know, the list is very long. Ah, government, I can't do that. Well, they want the service, but they have issues around governments with data. So I think we've got to keep thinking about this dual challenge with a backdrop of security that's really important, the dual challenge of policy evolving to meet the demand where younger people in particular are very willing to provide personal data if it means they're going to get better service and better value for money. Any comments from either of the two of you on this point? Uh, I'm hearing from the other side of the panel that there may be a generational discrepancy in the way we view data uh, privacy issues and data security issues, and there may also be perhaps a regional discrepancy in terms yeah. of emerging economies versus... Uh, Just wanted to make a joke. I was very positive, and I think I'm probably the older in the panel. <laughs> so, <laughs> but would would you see it the same way, the two of you? Go ahead, Mr. Singatia, and then I'll he, yeah. He can speak first, and then I, I will. Say Please, something. sure. So uh, yeah, uh, uh, as far as data protection is concerned, and when we are talking about the uh, data safety, uh, you know, uh, as an organization, we are very, mm, you know, you can say. Mm, transparent as far as whatever we are sharing and whatever we are collecting from the customer. <coughs> uh, but I have nothing much to comment upon uh, what uh, Mr. Dixon have said. And Is this an issue for people in India? Are they worried about possible abuses of their data and or security issues? So uh, the question, and, uh, as far as the data uh, security is concerned, I mean, government have introduced so many other authentications in India. For example, it's so easy to swipe a card here in the US without any second authentication. In India, you just can't swipe the card. You have to put in second authentication also to prove that it's the you it's, it's the actual user who, who, who holds the card, is you know, making, making the payments. And that's the only reason Uber you know, got uh, into a controversy as far as the payments of payments are concerned, because they were saving the credit card details in their mobile application. 
and the Central Bank of India then you know uh, put a notice saying that you know you just can't deduct money without any second authentication. So uh, in our country, I think government is much more sensitive towards the data safety as far as uh, the the financials are concerned of the uh, of the uh, of the citizens. Yeah, but uh, uh, yeah, uh, we are still in the transition for for a for a better you know data protection policy. Uh, it's not still in place, but it's yeah you know. Um, because uh, a stronger data policy, stronger data protection policy is somehow considered as anti-business, you know. So, uh, for example, I must say that Uber must be complaining that India is not a very uh, conducive country for me because her payments are not as, uh, as swift and as smooth as I can do it in U.S. Mm -hmm. But then the Indian government is saying, no, uh, you just can't uh, bypass the regulations that we have. So we have, there is a struggle between the stringent regulation for data production as well as the business convenience. So things are now going to and fro, and I think we'll be having a midway for business convenience as well as data should be protected. That's, yeah. Thank you very much. Ms. Mourinho Toscano. Well, I, uh, I look at it in another way. Uh, this uh, question of um, security is very important, uh, but um, I look at it in the way of the commercial exclusion that the system is uh, broad, making broad. Um, uh, let me tell you, um, you can pay for um, a central uh, the beginning place of your information system. And um, what is that is uh, resulting is that the information that you have is only the big, 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 big company informations. And in the center of the city, as uh, Mexico City, old city is, you have lots of uh, petty workers, artisans, and uh, people that do uh, things with their hand, um, jewelry, uh, or even uh, they, they, in other times, they make your sweets for you. But these people cannot be in the first place of the information, not even in the last place of the information. And what that is going to do if we don't think about it and we don't work uh, for a solution is that these um, uh, little works in the cities that in our cities, America Latina uh, cities, it's very important, are going to be out of the world. Yeah. And so we must imagine also uh, systems of information that uh, are more inclusive, mm -hmm. no? So this is a very important point of the discussion of what are cities going to be in the next centuries. And I, I always think that diversity and, and uh, uh, ex possibility of discovering a fantastic place, etc., is going to be always a very good thing for a city. Thank you very much. A very interesting point. We often refer to the digital divide, but in fact, you're talking about a connectivity divide. Uh, very interesting indeed. Thank you for that. I'd like to take audience questions now. Who has a question they'd like to pose? Please come over here to the microphones, and if you'd be so kind as to remind us who you are, that would be helpful. So you first, please, and then perhaps you want to uh, get in place uh, as well. Go ahead. Yes, uh, Philippe Christ with the uh, International Transport Forum at the uh, OECD. I have a question for, for Michael and also for Arvind about this issue of data privacy. Because, uh, Michael, you say, uh, give us our data or give us your money. Um, <laughs> but I'd like to hear a, a lot of our data collection mechanisms Quoted. have been, in fact, designed without baking in privacy or baking in protection measures. Um, so the whole issue of how privacy by design is evolving over time is something that I'd like to, to hear some input from you. In particular, I'll give an example. Location data, GP, GPS coordinates are transmitted in plain text and non-anonymized. 
Um, but now with the arrival of chips and chips and processors combined, you can anonymize that data on the fly, send it in, and give users control over who they share that data with and specific use cases where they share that data. So how do you see the evolution of consumer control over data combined with te technology evolutions that allow that consumer control in your business models, both on IBM and possibly also uh, for you in India? Uh, we could run the whole conference, I think, on, on the kind of issues you've raised here. Um, and obviously, they're right at the heart of the matter. So, so when, I, when I talk about um, give us the data or the money, what, what, what I'm trying to get at, or the point I'm trying to make, it's a nice quote I get, but, but the, the point is really important, which is there is such an intense requirement now to prove that money we spend and things we do are directly linked to services that people are prepared to pay for. And so you've got to think about how, what's the relationship between the ability of the technology to provide high levels of service at better levels of cost and, and what's the trade-off as we engage with the privacy provisions that are affected or come into play as you design those services. Um, I, I think it's important to go back to the comment I made, I think, first um, this morning. W it's early days. So I, I think a, a, as we tackle these, it, it's very much, I think you used the word, an evolutionary process. And, and so I think uh, as we design these things, one of the, the things that's really interesting in, in, in my role, uh, as we move around the world and work in different cities, it's very difficult to find someone who wants to be first to do something. But th the line of people that want to be, of cities that want to be second is very, very long. So, so I, I think this idea of scaling results around the world, and you know, we come back to you know, all sorts of issues around cybercrime. You know, if someone hits you over the head and takes your car, it's no big deal because it's kind of one person and one car. But if someone works out how to steal a large amount of credit data, it's got structural ramifications. So I, I think that the, the, the easy answer to your question is it's a very tightly controlled evolutionary process where the technology is being applied to develop commercial services and you come back to this balance which is critical in every issue, which is what's government policy in governing the kinds of privacy concerns and how can the technology compensate and meet those requirements while at the same time, how do we continue to deliver better services at better value for money, which is really what people are, are demanding. I, th I think a critical point here is the role of the commercial sector in transport, for example, which traditionally has not been the case. Um, you, you know, if we want to go and buy a holiday, no one much cares about what we're doing. You've got a choice. You can go buy the holiday or not. But once you start saying, well, I'm going to use public infrastructure, then privacy becomes a very big issue and, and you've got to manage it effectively. Thank you. Mr. Singatia? Yeah. Uh, if I understood your question correctly, I mean, uh, consumer control over data is what uh, you think and you advocate, you have an, you know, thought that it should be controlled by the consumer I with the usage of technology. I'm just wondering how greater consumer control might affect your, your business. Uh sure. For So, uh, you know, we what we use is, we are not using the credit card data with us for the payments and that's why uh, uh, we have introduced the concept of, uh, you know, a payment wallet where a person can recharge it and uh, where he has a better control rather than a credit card uh, saving with us. Number one, and then uh, we are also in discussion with the government and government now considering the policy to introduce a concept of small transactions should be kept out of the second authentication. This kind of understanding from the authorities uh, help the businesses, you know, to uh, to 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 uh, save the data of the uh, individual and uh, to use them for the smaller amounts. I mean, uh, that's uh, that's the balance between what uh, authority and the uh, business can, you know, have. Yep. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, Simon Eason from the uh, University of Australia Network. I'm very fascinated, Michael Dixon, um, by your very profound overview of some of the factors affecting our change. You talked about a shift towards user pays. You talked about a very, very big shift from the younger community towards on demand. And you seem to imply that a great deal of the push and the drive towards multimodal transport networks, towards 
um, a different way of thinking about transportation is coming from the consumer. And, and with the combination of business taking a bigger role in provision, that this is very much going to be a free market, competitive, business-driven type approach. At the same time, you talked about federal government not putting in monies and pushing the onus on cities, but you're seeing a lot of governments, particularly city governments, forming quite restrictive partnerships with the private sector to say build a motorway or a freeway and then limit the growth of um, a rail network because that will infringe on toll fees coming from the, the, the road network where they've just signed a contract. How much do you see, and, this, uh, and the, I think the thing you teased us with at the end, which was fascinating, was that this is really a cultural and political issue, not a technology issue, and that the rest is just work once we've sorted out the culture and the politics. How much do you see that the future is going to be consumer and demand driven for better services, or how much there's going to be a push from enlightened government agencies and departments that say, we will make this happen, for example, by actually diminishing the amount of parking in the city centre, so you have to use these other type of policies. How much will it become a need for government push because business and citizen demand in itself won't drive change fast enough? Thank you. Uh, look, uh, I think it, um, I spoke earlier about why do cities opt into these things, and I think they do it because, you know, the shed's on fire, we've got to do something, and I think that's where you see the most innovation. So I, I think you need to look at cities who tackle the kinds of issues you're talking about, and they have to do something. They have to bring around urban mobility or intermodal transport because they can't cope with the growth and their GDP is being strangled or, or uh, other issues that are, are very obvious. Um, I, th I think the second thing that, that underpins um, your, uh, the issues you've raised I is the business case that, that fits these things. None of this is done with incremental money. You know, I, I meet people, government leaders all around the world, and no one's yet said to me, we've got too much money, what should we spend it on, you know? <laughs> Everybody is looking for a better efficiency, and I think, again, many of the issues that you're, that you're speaking about are brought into really sharp focus when you start working out what the business case is underneath that, and the modelling that we do is very much uh, aligned with that. The thing that we haven't talked about, I guess it's, it's a, a little... Um, you know, it, it's a generalisation, but th the real issue is leadership here. And and um, again, if you go if you go and look at the you know the kinds of things that Christian Estrosi is doing in the south of France, or Ed Pays in Rio, or or um, Carlos Jimenez, you know, in, here in Miami, um, these are really strong leaders that that are prepared to make decisions and do things and tackle the issues that you've talked about. You know, the 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 issues associated with getting billions of dollars to build a private road, but then facing the fact there's a 30 year concession for tolls associated with that to pay for the provision for structure that everybody you know, should be able to use. So it comes back to this balance between public and private sector, um, which I think again, you know, later in my career, it's the biggest shift I've seen, which is this blurring between public and private sector, which is going to get much greater. Um, as, as governments around the world work out that effectively working with um, the private sector is a way to resolve some of these issues. But going back to the transport thing I said earlier, to, to resolve connected cars, um, you know, uh, existing assets and, and new assets into a model which allows sharing across all modes is really important and the policy that goes with that is critical. So, um, you know, I think the answer to your question comes back to these things, you know, what has to be done, what's really important, what's the business case that makes this pay, a and who's the leader that's going to stand up and say, I'm going to make some decisions that's not going to keep everybody happy, but will deliver benefit. Thank you. Um, I'm going to ask for relatively short questions and answers because we're getting, uh, that's quite all right, we're getting a little bit toward the end of our session. So go ahead, uh, I've got three Morning. there and we'll cut it off after that. Morning, my name is Evan Brigham, I'm a traffic engineer out of Raleigh. I have a quick comment kind of that popped into my head as, as I was thinking about the data. Um, every time you download an app, it asks you, what's your location, you know, we want information on your location, your, um, your Facebook status, your first burn trial, it wants everything, um, terms and conditions, and you just kind of click through it. So it's kind of like if you want the app, you have to provide the data, and I, I think that kind of supports your argument. Another thing I wanted to ask you um, was, I go to a lot of citizen advisory committee meetings and like um, 
citizen groups that recommend you know, land uses, and it's a lot of older crowd there. How do you integrate the millennials who are doing Facebook statuses about these type of things, um, and how do you get the, the cities to take those seriously, whereas it's a Facebook status, should be taken as seriously as going to a meeting where the millennials might not go to the meeting as the older people do. So how do you integrate um, comments on Facebook or whatever to, um, to the older folks? So. Back to that generation issue. Ms. Munoz? <laughs> yes, actually, and I, I'll just make two statements that had come uh, after I heard uh, the colleagues here. Uh, when we talk about the divide, the ICT divide, uh, it may not be a divide of exclusion of a certain part of the population, but segmentation between two markets. We were talking about the very uh, developed systems that uh, private sector companies are putting in place and some enlightened pu public sector entities are putting in place to manage better their business. But we also have all these, you know, uh, uh, either people in more informal activities or the younger generations, which have a very dynamic system of communication. So uh, I think it's more of a matter of a, a risk of segmentation and can, how can we actually tap uh, those sources from the sort of informal sector, if you were to call it like that. And the other comment I was going to make is that uh, based, I mean, uh, related to the comment I made at the beginning about how um, you know, I wanted to, to convey here the idea of smart cities. Enlightened governments, I would think, are governments that tap into those sources of information that give them, uh, you know, data about what their uh, citizens think and want. Do you want to say a brief word also to that, Michael Dixon, about uh, the millennials versus the, as he put it, older folks? <laughs> <laughs> Look, I, I think, you know, again, it's this evolutionary approach and we can't think that what we have today is what's going to matter. You know, IBM has signed an agreement with Twitter where we, we work with Twitter on all the Twitter related information. We're doing a lot in emergency management. You know, when, when there's an earthquake or a fire or a hurricane, um, the value of social media in providing real time information to, to uh, first responders and those that are uh, uh, trying to cope with the, the crisis is, is the best data you can get. So, so I think um, you know, there are new structures emerging and, and we have to embrace them. And, uh, you know, we've got a whole group in HR that are trying to work out how we engage younger people. Uh, people like me that have, you know, been in a linear career, perhaps many in the room, a linear career where you've worked hard for kind of delayed... Gra it doesn't apply. The kids today, you know, 25, 28, I just don't think they're not interested in that. You know, you say, oh, we think you could do... Play well, they look at you like this, you're from Mars. They go, I'm not doing that, you know. A and we're trying to work out. That this is critical. You cannot think that what we've had for the last decade or the last 20 years is what we've got for the next... It's just not going to be like that. Thanks very much. So I'll take the last two questions together uh, and we'll bundle them and then we'll get a really quick answer. Go ahead. Okay, yeah, uh, Raymond Von Killen, I work for the Environment and Natural Resources um, Global Practice here at the bank. Um, I come from an urban planning background, so I'm interested in urban form and its relationship with transportation. So I think it's generally accepted, um, I could be wrong, but uh, generally accepted that, that dealing with urban form or land use um, planning in isolation um, from their, uh, you know, uh, from their interdependencies, um, can cause a lot of risk, right? So, um, I'm curious to know from your experience or some of your suggestions to um, transportation planners, those interested in in driving sustainable transportation policy. What do you do when you uh, when you're running up against uh, an urban form which is not conducive to the planning, the long-term planning, sustainable? practices that you want to install from a transportation perspective, um, whether it be uh, height restrictions in India, um, uh, the sprawling cities that we're seeing scenes, uh, here in the United States, in Houston, for example, um, where urban form is really, um, and, and of course there's that time lag, urban form in itself can last many, many, many years. Transportation is, is, a, is a changing animal and it can change rather quickly. The, how do you reconcile these two different things? Uh, I think it's an important question. Thank you. Let's take the next question as well. We did briefly address that, uh, of course, in, in terms of big sprawling cities. What can they do as a quick fix or a retro fitting? But let's, we'll briefly address it in a moment. Go ahead, please, with the last question. Uh, my name is Rafael Duma. I, I work at the MIT Transit Research Group. Last year, um, the speaker from IBM mentioned their interest in open source software, and I was wondering if any of the panelists had um, experiences or 
feel good stories about open source software. Thank you. Okay, thanks very much. Um, so briefly, perhaps going back to that question of a big existing sprawling city like Mexico City, Ms. Moreno Toscana, Ms. Munoz, what can you do um, retroactively, so to speak? Yes. Um, suppose you cannot change anything about the physical uh, city. Uh, you have to work in those conditions. And so you have to have information of um, in, in uh, non-direct information, but uh, uh, information of where the um, uh, s a system is uh, working worst to work there, and uh, where you can make your innovations. And what is happening uh, to all cities, I mean, Mexico City, uh, but London, it's the same thing. What is happening uh, is that some of the streets are not used for transit, okay? That's a good notice. What are we going to do with these streets? Are we going to change it in parks? Or we use them for sports? And, and that is the kind also of decisions that is reshaping our cities. So um, what we used to say about the urban form, no, it is important, but um, I mean, you can reuse it in another ways. So the container, the box can be filled with not another um, uh, cookies. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, I don't, I, I have my uh, distance with the form of the city because these enormous cities have a form that is not uh, understandable. Thank you very much. Ms. Munoz? No, definitely. That, that, that coordination between urban planners and transport specialists is crucial. And, uh, you know, we need, uh, we need to continue to work uh, on that in the bank and also to convey that to, to, to our clients through the way we work. Uh, but just uh, one idea uh, is uh, we are working a lot and we're getting a lot of interest on the topic of uh, uh, urban center regeneration and renovation, which is actually an idea to try to, uh, you know, replenish the value of those centers that probably has been, have been lost through, you know, the, the, the decay of economic activity in the centers. And that can be a way, actually, to bring back activity and life to the center. Uh, public, uh, private public, uh, you know, partnerships in bringing that re re regeneration is crucial. So I think that's one of the things that can be done. It may not work for all cities, but it's something that, yes, I mean, instead of uh, thinking of limits around the city, thinking of how one can bring activity back to the center. And this is definitely a very difficult uh, issue that you have raised. Thank you very much. And a brief answer uh, from our other two panelists about open source. Uh, Positive experiences? Uh, we have, IBM has a, a system called Bluemix, which is now available globally. Um, and it's something that has, provides entrepreneurial developers with broad access to a whole raft of software development tools, open source and otherwise. So, uh, it, and it's staggeringly successful. We can't keep up with the demand of entrepreneurial people using these tools to develop new capabilities. And one final comment from the first question on urban planning. It's an incredibly exciting area. Uh, I'm in the process of signing an agreement with a global architect, which a few years ago I wouldn't have thought I would ever even spoken to them, yet we're, we see a lot of opportunity to develop policy with, with leading commercial designs around the world. We've got commercial development in brown fields and green fields with companies like Loder in India, Palava City and other places where this whole urban form and bringing together planning of things, not just transport, but waste management, water management, utilities and other things is very much a part of both the architectural design and then the commercial implementation. Thanks very much. Uh, Mr. Singatia? Okay. Nothing to say, he says. So uh, many, many thanks. And uh, 
it was a very wide-ranging, very thought-provoking panel. I uh, thank all of you for that. We're going to give the applause at the end because I want to give just a few hints to the audience whom I also thank for your attention and your participation this morning in this plenary. We now go to a coffee break. After the coffee break, there will be parallel sessions until lunch and more parallel sessions after lunch. Unfortunately, I cannot tell you what they all are and where they all are because it would take us the whole coffee break to do so. So may I ask you to please consult with your programs. You will see the locations. Some of them are not on this floor of the bank. They are on a lower floor, I believe. So in that case, you do need to please take the elevators to get there. Also for lunch, there will be lunch served here in the bank in the cafeteria. It is also on the lower level, C1. So you can get there as well with the elevators. There are restaurants around the area. Most of them are pretty quick. You probably could make it to a restaurant and back in time for those parallel sessions. We will meet back here at 4 o'clock for our last plenary of the day. It's a call to action. You don't want to miss it because we're going to try to sum up all of the themes of the various discussions that we've had and figure out what actions we need to take? What are the crucial first steps to really begin to act on some of the transformational ideas that have been generated and discussed here? So please uh, come back here at 4 o'clock for that. I'm looking forward to seeing you again, and I wish you very, very productive discussions until then. See you later. Thanks again, and thanks to all of you.